Welcome everyone to our panel on charting the business uh, landscape of AI and games, digital media, and entertainment. Uh, my name is Kat Duncan, and I'm a corporate partner here at Fenwick & West. Uh, I work with uh, technology companies, and in particular, gaming companies. And I'm pleased to be joined today by uh, Moritz Bayard Lenz, who is a partner and the head of gaming at Lightspeed Venture Partners, which is a global uh, leading venture capital firm managing over $29 billion. Uh, and more than 500 investments across the United States, Europe, Asia, and uh, he's made investments in companies like Epic Games, Stability AI, and Snap. Uh, previously, Moritz was a partner and management team member at Bitcraft and founded and led uh, Goldman Sachs uh, Global Gaming Practice. Uh, and uh, has numerous accolades to attach to his name, uh, including that he's a Forbes 30 under 30 honoree. He's a young global leader of the World Economic Forum, and he has an MBA from Stanford. Uh, additionally, Moritz was also a competitive gamer. And uh, for those of you that are, are gamers yourselves, I think it's one of his, <laughs> it was his most, uh, one of his most impressive accolades for me was that he was a uh, ranked number one player of Diablo 2. Uh, amongst the 13 million players that played the game. Uh, so Moritz, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I think we're going to just jump right in uh, and talk just generally about uh, the you know industry landscape and the trends that are going on right now in AI and game development. It is uh, just something that is so top of mind right now. And so I uh, wanted to just get your thoughts on how you envision AI technology transforming uh, the investment market itself and um, how it's changing the way that you guys are thinking about investment decisions and the due diligence process. Uh, you know, as, as someone who is evaluating gaming companies, you know, daily. Yeah, unfortunately, we, we still have to diligence and make decisions ourselves mm -hmm. for now. Or maybe that's that's probably a good thing, I should say. Um, although I, I do think ultimately investing is probably a discipline that, that can get automated or or AI'd away uh, ultimately as well. I don't think we're, we're safe either. Um, but I would say so far, I mean, the, the main uh, impact right now is in terms of content, where I think as part of the diligence, you would want to make sure you at least get a good answer for how companies are thinking through what we consider a platform shift. Um, I think in a couple of years, there are no AI companies or gaming AI companies or consumer or enterprise AI companies. Like All companies will have to think through their AI strategy or what AI means for them. It's going to be similar to saying you're a, you're a mobile phone or an internet company. That's just a normality today. And I think the same will be true for AI. So even if today a company would not use the word AI in a one sentence description of themselves, I think we want to see some um, some thoughtfulness on, on how it impacts their business model and uh, product strategy with regards to methods of the due diligence and the investing process. Um, we have a three person team at Lightspeed that's exclusively building internal um, analysis and intelligence tools for us. That's been the case for years now. Um, I don't want to reveal all our secrets, but I think it's fair to say that um, we are leveraging some AI in the in the methods in which we are analyzing and diligencing companies right now. And that's a tool suite that will expand quite a bit. Um, some of the areas that you could envision, um, you know, seeing inside Lightspeed or, or other firms as well, we know they're working on that too, of course, is... Um, uh, you know, you, you imagine something like next to an email, um, you see not only relationship intelligence, like who's met this company before, are the, what are the previous interactions over email, um, in-person events, what are the firm's connections to the sender? Like, I think this is standard and provided by tools like Affinity, which I personally love. Um, but you could uh, automate comparisons with portfolio companies, um, other screened opportunities. You could um, automatically pull in market size, um, usage information for what the AI deems this, this company to be, any directly available or inferable financial information, growth metrics. Um, if it's a company in the consumer segment, you can pull in customer sentiment, NPS analysis, social media. Um, you know, we and others are using this already, have competitive funds recently followed uh, these founders on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, have competitors mentioned the company or founders in, in tweets. Not all of this is AI. Some of this is just 
data intelligence, but this this is a kind of a glimpse into what we have and what we're building out internally. Uh, that's also uh, that's just really interesting to see how you are you're employing AI. Just you know, in terms of how you're doing your analysis of companies. Kind of shifting to um, the trends that you specifically see impacting the companies you're evaluating, and in particular, gaming companies. Um, what are the promising trends that you're seeing from those companies that you're evaluating? Mm -hmm. Most companies that are at this intersection of gaming and AI, and I've looked at about, I'd say, three, three to four hundred over the last um, three and a half years. Half of them probably in the last twelve months. Um, most I would categorize as workflow improvements, um, and I find those less um, interesting or ultimately like impactful on a on a generational level. And like trying to hunt for you know what one billion, five billion, ten billion dollar companies, I think we'll see fewer of those in in this segment of workflow improvements. But this is basically helping game developers build games better, faster, stronger, cheaper, um, helping them create. 2D and 3D assets uh, easier or, or, or better, um, helping with animation, helping with sound, um, helping with game testing, uh, game moderation. There's, a, I'd say, three quarters or more, probably, of gaming AI companies fall into this um, subcategory, if you want so. And then the other half that I personally find a lot more interesting is novel experiences or new experiences. Because if you think about previous platform shifts. And I'm using this word platform shift, even though it's not really clean. It's not a it's not a new platform per se, as was the consumer PC or, or the mobile phone. But every time we had those innovations, the companies that actually succeeded and overthrew incumbents were the ones that didn't make things just a little bit better, but offered something completely new. In gaming, for example, when the mobile phone emerged as a platform, um, Zynga came in with the idea that people would want to game casually all the time while they're waiting in queue for a minute or two. Um, that didn't exist as, as a modality, really. Rovio innovated tactile touchscreen um, gameplay with Angry Birds. That didn't exist. So I think we'll see the same in AI. Um, so it's not just about making things a little better. It's offering something completely new. There aren't many examples there, but uh, one area that I find super exciting is intelligent NPCs. Um, if you think about video games, most of the interactions with um, agents in, in this world, if it's not a multiplayer game, they're actually pretty shallow and, and dumb. Um, they're typically decision trees, some yeah. pre-configured uh, you know, text options, and somehow we've we've come to closure with the fact that that's just how games are built. But I really don't think it should be. And if you really want to take a step back and get a little bit more philosophical with me, and I know, sorry, this is a long, long answer, but I, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. Um, we've, if you if you think about physical reality, what what matters oftentimes more is not where you are, but whom you are with, and so. It's it's kind of interesting how most of game design and like game engines and Unreal and Unity focus so much on making things really beautiful and you know photorealistic. We know graphics don't matter that much, and we can already create a super realistic version of Manhattan. But who would really want to spend time in it if it's not just filled with also you know two million, eight million? Uh, amazing New Yorkers with their dreams, hopes, aspirations, background stories. And so um, there are companies that are working on filling worlds with life and agents uh, that don't just interact with the player, but also with each other. Uh, that I think is probably, from, from what I can tell, the most exciting new avenue that wasn't previously possible, but is possible with AI. But uh, no, I hear what you're saying because it basically it's providing like a richer player experience um, that isn't as like, for lack of a better, as, as wooden, uh, where you just mm -hmm. feel like you're, you're traveling on a track, right? Um, yeah. And I guess just to, to, to follow this thread, so you've touched on like how there's a lot of potential um, for AI and player engagement. How do you see AI uh, applications? Um, having an impact like on user retention and monetization, because those are obviously big 
uh, top topics of mind, right? For a, for a gaming studio that's uh, that's looking to put out the next great game. Yeah, I mean, on the on the on the front of new experiences, I think these these will these AI NPCs, for example, will result in in higher engagement and higher retention. It is just it just does create a more compelling, immersive world. Um, but even on the on the side of workflow improvements, um, some, especially on the mobile side, some AI first game studios are experimenting with an automated loop of 2D, 3D asset generation and then immediate A-B testing. So if you think of um, Candy Crush, for example, uh, there are there are companies that are innovating the um, the puzzle or like other casual formats with automated creation where let's see, you know, let's say gemstones or, or, or other elements of this puzzle are uh, switched with, um, you know, cat faces or dog faces. And like, and then immediately also only serving that to a portion of the audience, analyzing the retention and engagement, feeding that back into the algorithm. Maybe, maybe cat faces are the ones that perform the best. Okay. Can we make the cats a little bit more cute? or a, a little more realistic looking and, and kind of like iterate from there to, to basically in a fully integrated way, creating the, the ultimately retaining version of, of the game. We haven't seen it go into core loops themselves. So this is just kind of like iterating on the visual pieces while the actual game and the, the gameplay itself is still defined by humans and by developers. But you can easily see this go a little step further, where now maybe maybe we're testing whether five rows or seven rows or, and, and columns is, is a more engaging format. And then one step from there, maybe completely different puzzle experiences. Um, we'll probably see that or so something like this emerge over the next few years. That's not real just yet. Um, but I'd also be surprised not to see it become reality in the next two, three, four years. Well, you've talked about um, sort of the impact on on mobile games. Are there any particular genres or types of games that you think are going to uh, benefit the most from AI integration? Yeah, I think so. Because of this A-B testing, I think the, the ones that are most defined by just switching out visual assets and less innovation on, on gameplay. So I think the more the more casual, like hyper casual stuff, probably lends itself best to it, at least these early, um, you know, AI automations. And then you know on the other on the other side of the spectrum, uh, if you think about intelligent NPCs or really really playing with the, the wealth of the user experience, it's the open world games, the RPG. So it's it's almost on like the two sides of the the spectrum is is where we we'll probably see most innovation ones that want to really push the boundaries of what's possible. And on the other hand, just like the, the kind of tweakers and hyper optimizers, which is casual and hyper casual. And so I guess um, considering all of this potential, because we've talked about what's available now and what we where we think directionally it could be going, do you have any advice for an, ins- an, an aspiring game developer who wants to leverage AI for their projects? Yeah, I mean, I would say this... This is not just true for gaming, but I think a lot of um, certainly consumer applications, but probably also enterprise applications. Like, it's never been a better time to build a company because platform shifts usually provide a great opportunity to um, to shake things up a little bit. And then, because of the superpowers that you get with AI, if you use it right, you can effectively run a, a twenty person company with a with a five person company today. I, I, I truly believe that. I mean, I have a, I have a tab of um, chat GPT open all the time. I use it for writing every day. Um, I use it for idea generation every day. I, I have friends who effectively force their developers to use co- co-pilots and who, who think that their developers are three to four times more effective using co-pilot. I mean, if that's anywhere close to true, then, um, you know, People, people talk all day about the market and the downturn and how hard it is to get funding. Not from where I'm sitting. I, I, I see, at least in gaming, valuations haven't really cooled off in the early stage. Um, I've seen Q1, I've seen more quality gaming 
uh, investable opportunities than I've ever seen in my career since Q1 of 2020, since, since my investing career in, in gaming. And so I think there are no excuses to, to build a company. That would be my, my advice to founders. Uh, well, that's actually all really great to hear, uh, especially for the founders that are that are uh, watching. Um, so I guess just kind of transitioning into, uh, you know, how you think about this all as an investor. Um, are there any particular indicators that you're looking for when evaluating a gaming startup's potential for, for growth and future success? And how does AI factor into that? Yeah, so um, we... Uh at Lightspeed in the, in the gaming division. And a lot of this will come to life uh, in about a month from today when we launch our Lightspeed gaming website. So people should uh, keep an eye out for that. But um, we're, we're very selective in our gaming investments. We make probably around six to eight per year. We have, we have roughly 35 right now. Um, and so call that half game studios, half um, platforms and technology companies. So two to three game studios per year, uh, or let's say three three game studios per year on average. Um, the bar is pretty high for those. I usually love to see one of the co-founders at least being a, a lead designer or a lead producer of a game um, or gaming franchise that previously grossed at least $250 million per year. So that basically eliminates 99% plus of, of opportunities. That's, that's, you know, right now, that's maybe a market of 20 people that, that could qualify. Um, I think building games is just super hard. Um, there is a bit of a kingmaker dynamic where if you infuse one of these game studios with 30 to $50 million, they're immediately in a, in an, in an, advantageous position, but um, the game studios that I've funded at Lightspeed and then also previously at Bitcraft, um, I think they've been they've been among the greatest designers and producers that we've seen over the last 10 years. And it's a strategy that has worked out well. Um, so I'm I'm not uh, yeah, I don't. I don't see any reason to to change it. <laughs> on the on the platforms and technology companies and gaming, it's a completely different. Um, that that's a much broader space. Uh, there, it's this is really more like um, you know SaaS investing and in, in, in some of consumer software and or enterprise software. Uh, if it's more on the on the tech side of things, and this is uh, um, the I think the bar for you know previous experience or previous accomplishments matters less in, in those cases. And there we invest primarily based on the concept and the metrics. Uh, typically, maybe in a in a series A and B rather than a seat round. For the game studios, I'm totally comfortable to go in as early as possible, uh, preferably actually in the seat round. So do you have, um, did you want to share maybe an example or two of a successful investment that Lightspeed has made uh, in a gaming company? And it, if there's any that are related to AI, that that would be helpful as well. Yeah. So, um, I mean, Epic Games is a pretty popular uh, <laughs> one, I think. Um, I've only announced one so far, uh, which was in March, um, a company called Believer. Uh, the founding duo is uh, are the two executive producers of League of Legends and Wild Rift at, at Riot Games. So what, one of them is a founding member of Riot Games. Uh, the two of them pretty much fit the the, the bill that I described, I think the games they let as executive producers have grossed over $10 billion today. So it's kind of like an extreme example of a of a starting team and probably the best team we've seen in like two years uh, come to market. So a uh, good one to, to lead and, and kind of like start the uh, gaming investing career at, at Lightspeed with, hopefully. Um, but for any game studio, like you, I think if... If AI and how they will leverage AI in their workflows and how AI will drive the user experience, like if they don't, if that's not automatically part of the pitch, I think even if you have to ask that question today, um, that's already a bit of a yellow flag. Mm -hmm. And it's also very easy to discern after 30 minutes or an hour of conversation on, on, on the topic, whether it's just an alibi conversation or if, if they genuinely plan to build an, an AI forward game studio, because I think if you're starting a company, especially in, in AAA or cross-platform today, you're launching your game in three to four years. 
if you're not thinking about AI in pre-production or even even prototyping, I, I think you're basically you basically are at an above fifty percent risk to be irrelevant by the time the game comes out. So for you, is AI is effectively table stakes now for any company that's coming to to talk to you? It should be table stakes of um, especially the the prototype and, and pre-production. It should be table stakes for consideration. Um, yeah. So okay. that that yeah, that's how I would put it. Not thinking about it at all is probably a big problem. Uh, working with it creatively in the early stages of game development will likely put you in a very advantageous position. So it sounds like you think it's going to be important for not only the success, but also like the exits of these companies, because you're always keeping an eye on that as well. Yeah, I mean, if, if for example, I think intelligent NPCs were like at the cusp of this becoming reality and production. Um, Niantic and Inworld, uh, for example, announced uh, this week um, an, an AR experience with an owl that you can just talk to like freely. You can, you can summon it on, on the desk in, in front of you, have a full-blown conversation with this owl. Um, so it's starting to get very real um, in terms of capabilities and also in terms of economics. Like we can we can do this kind of stuff now in a way that's that's cost efficient or or not not kind of prohibitive. Um, so if it kind of works today, I feel like it's probably going to be table stakes in five years or a lot earlier than that. So if you're starting a game now, if you're building an RPG game or an open world game and you're not planning for intelligent NPCs, you may run risk, uh, you may run at risk of like no one even wanting to play this when it comes out. Zero dollars in revenue probably also means zero dollars in exit. Or, or slightly better accu higher than that. And so, yeah, I think it's the same from an exit perspective, if you're asking that, this is the same consideration. All, all excellent points. Um, I guess just to transition a little bit about how your, uh, you know, how Lightspeed works with their uh, portfolio companies. Um, how are you working with them in terms of thinking about the evolving AI landscape and, um, you know, just to align their growth strategies and 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 just be thoughtful about these issues. Yeah, one I, I'd say one overarching thing I really like about Lightspeed, um, and I'm not saying this like in a in a marketing way. I, I really think it's a it's a smart strategy and one that just personally resonates a lot with how I like to um, partner with companies because we only invest in about three companies per partner per year, um, we actually have plenty of time as partners uh, to work directly with our portfolio companies. So there are there are companies where I, I've just camped out for two or three days at their headquarters, and we've basically done a complete review of product monetization, partnerships, and we'll brainstorm for like three entire days how I can help, what I can do. Um, I love doing that. I think it makes a lot of sense um i don't know how people do that when you're investing in let's say 10 per partner per year there's just you know you can always i guess you can hand off portfolio companies to like a big support team but it's i like to believe it's not not quite the same um we have a founder success team too obviously for uh, you know, talent, marketing, and, and PR, and I, I look them in, but I, I like to be on every email. Maybe I'm just a little bit more hyper than, than other investors, but that's fine. Uh, and then the other thing, the other thing that's cool and it's super helpful for the AI stuff is we all, all of us are investing from the same vintage of funds. So we don't, even though we're now managing 30 billion. Uh, we don't really segregate by, you know, let's say enterprise, consumer, uh, gaming um, from a fund design perspective. There's no enterprise fund. There's no consumer fund. There's no gaming fund. Um, for us as partners, our carry is not tied to the companies we invest in or even our sector. All of us draw from the same carry pool across all sectors and across all geographies. So, of course... People love to see their own companies succeed. Um, 
for your immediate financial rewards is actually irrelevant for me personally if uh, you know the gaming companies are the ones that go through the roof and you know return the fund to to 3x or whether it's that healthcare company in Israel and so what that means for supporting portfolio companies if i need meaningful support from the enterprise team especially our ai ml experts we we have investors that haven't invested in anything else but ai ml for the last few years not just before this recent craze or we have an expert for developer tools for example i can loop them into gaming deals i can loop them into gaming portfolio company support and it makes sense for them to spend their time on it because they're actually their their incentives are aligned to help us make the right decisions and then also to support the companies to the best of their ability i i love that model honestly it's very rare for for funds of this size um yeah i think it's smart i didn't come up with it obviously but um <laughs> you know i I'm doing my best to integrate nicely into it. Well, it, it, uh, I mean, it sounds great that you're so hands-on with uh, with your portfolios. And it sounds like that's a great way to sort of stay ahead of the curve on what the uh, developing technologies like AI are um, presenting kind of like on the, like as a boot on the ground. Um, and it sounds like you also have kind of a, a team of folks who are staying abreast of these issues, but like any other ways that Lightspeed, yourself, or just anyone who's watching here, um, how how to stay ahead and, and be thinking about these issues like AI um, and, and to be kind of seen around the corners and where the development's going. Yeah, I mean, so we have we have pretty close ties to um, to research and the university landscape too. Like, you know, you know we're, we're partnering closely with Stanford on a few topics. There's a there's a good talent pool to to draw from there in terms of uh, investable founders or even just subject matter experts. We also recently launched a, a series called uh, Generative, and then New York Generative SF Generative LA, um, hosting. AI ML founders in those cities on a monthly basis. Um, we're, we're in our second monthly run for New York. Uh, we're launching the LA version on Tuesday. Um, and so I think for founders who want to get in touch or for people who are interested in that, uh, maybe even as a, as a you know solo GP or, or early stage investor, like that's a great way to get in touch with us and, and hopefully talented people building. But you know, we're also we're investors in um, in some of the foundational models too. Like our enterprise team, I think co-led the last round, not the current round uh, that's that's in the press, but the previous round in stability AI. So so through some of these foundational AI investments, we also have a pretty good um, pulse in the market. Usually, it's your best founders who send you the next best founders, and we see the same dynamic in AI. That's great. Um, well, thanks so much for joining us, Moritz. Uh, really, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Uh, and it was so great to have you. And nice to see you. It's been a while. Uh, so hopefully we can catch up in person.